The travel nightmare in Denver. Drivers stranded on the highway as heavy, wet snow blankets the west. It's all part of the winter weather continuing to cause havoc from coast to coast. We'll have the latest on the storms moving across the country. Southwest Airlines remains under fire, offering yet another apology as the carrier tries to recover from the travel meltdown hitting customers after thousands of canceled flights in the past week. Luggage now continues to pile up at airports all across the country. ABC's Alex Perez tracking it all. Remembering the legend Pelé, a three-time World Cup winner and one of the most famous athletes of all time. Tonight, we'll bring you the tributes pouring in for the Brazilian soccer star who became a global icon and ambassador for the sport. Following the sentencing of two men accused of leading a plot to kidnap Michigan's governor, we talked to that state's attorney general on the battle to tackle domestic extremism. A firestorm in Hollywood over the inclusion of more black actors in sci-fi and fantasy series. We speak to creators and actors about the role of more diverse characters in fictional worlds and the intense backlash they've faced. It is violent, it is harassment, it is aggressive, it is racist. It's sometimes threatened the lives of us and our families. To those who are privileged, equality seems like punishment. And the social media mogul taking the fashion industry by storm. Ricky Thompson brings a big personality, trend-setting style, and one-of-a-kind dance moves to his followers. Tonight, the story behind his rapid rise to fame, making Forbes 30 under 30 list, and who most inspired him. So I was like, you know what? I want to be like her. So Rihanna definitely. Mm -hmm. And here you are. You know, <laughs> right? Like, this girl I'm making it. I'm like, I love that. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. The city of Buffalo is finally beginning to recover from that deadly blizzard that buried the city over the holidays. The death toll continues to rise as workers search the city. Bulldozers clearing the record snowfall, trying to get ahead of concerns about the flooding as snow starts to melt. But as Buffalo recovers, Denver is hit hard by another storm, slamming the west with heavy snow, causing accidents and shutting down Interstate 70, leaving many drivers stranded for hours. That system is now moving across the country, threatening to bring downpours on New Year's celebrations as thousands of Americans are still struggling to navigate this week's travel chaos. We're going to have full coverage tonight for you of the weather and the travel mess. We begin with ABC's Mola Lenghi from Denver. With millions hitting the roads ahead of the new year, a travel nightmare unfolding overnight in Colorado. This is crazy. Oh, boy. A fast developing snowstorm and faster falling temperatures sending things from bad to worse in a hurry on Interstate 70 outside Denver. Storm chaser Aaron Rigsby among hundreds of stranded drivers, some of them walking their dogs on the highway. There has been so many accidents and so many stuck vehicles that I-70 has now been shut down for almost 10 hours. There's been a few people that I think were in the tunnel that were a little worried about uh, carbon monoxide and they had their kind of doors propped up with like a towel in front of it. The heavy wet snow doing heavy damage to downtown Denver. As you can see, the storm system bringing down branches, and limbs blocking roadways in the area. At its peak, snow was coming down at a rate of two inches per hour. Even more limbs coming down right there, crashing into a storefront, shattering the business's window. The storms fueled by an atmospheric river that's pounding the West Coast with wind and rain. Meanwhile, in blizzard-ravaged western New York, the death toll continues to rise as authorities perform welfare checks. City officials finally lifting the ban on non-emergency vehicles. They're making headway, but as our Mona Kozar Abdi reports, the work is far from over. With temperatures rising, the snow is starting to melt. Officials are clearing storm drains in anticipation of any flooding, and the state is on standby with 800,000 sandbags. In Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, the Susquehanna River blocked by huge chunks of ice. They're worried about more flooding there, too, tonight. And Mola joins us now. Mola, how are the roads in Denver right now? Has there been much improvement? Yeah, hey, Phil, major roadways looking a bit better, but, you know, there's still a lot of snow on the ground. A lot of those secondary roads, uh, roads in subdivisions, neighborhoods, a lot of those are still unplowed. Uh, and with temperatures dropping below freezing tonight, a lot of that will likely freeze, Phil. All right, Mola Lange, thank you. And after that Christmas travel nightmare, Southwest Airlines now saying it expects to return to normal operations Friday. 
Today, however, it accounted for more than 90% of the flights canceled all across the country. That meltdown has stranded tens of thousands of passengers in cluttered airports with unclaimed baggage. ABC's Alex Perez with the latest. Tonight, Southwest Airlines vowing a return to normal operations is just hours away. Writing in a statement, we are encouraged by the progress we've made to realign crew, their schedules, and our fleet, and that they expect only minimal disruptions tomorrow. That moment can't come soon enough for the scores of families dealing with canceled flights, lost luggage, and unexpected expenses. The airline's chief commercial officer with this message. My personal apology is the first step of making things right after many plans changed and experiences fell short of your expectations of us. We're continuing the work to make this up to you. The airline canceling more than 2,300 flights today, more than 15,000 flights in all since last week Wednesday. I've never seen anything like this. This is absolutely crazy. After five days without her luggage, Christina Ariazola finally reunited with her belongings Wednesday at Dallas's Love Field. We've been hopping the stores, just buying clothes and toiletries and whatever we can. And I don't even have my medications because I mistakenly just put them in the suitcase. At Chicago's Midway Airport, officials there say the remaining unclaimed Southwest bags have been moved to a secure location. Baggage carts loaded with suitcases visible on the tarmac. Southwest now saying they will honor reasonable requests for reimbursement for meals, hotel, and alternate transportation from people whose flights were canceled or significantly delayed between December 24th and January 2nd. The airline urging travelers to submit receipts through their website. And Alex joins us now from Chicago's Midway Airport. Alex, we're starting to hear from families who had to buy more expensive tickets after their original Southwest flight got canceled. So what's the airline saying about that tonight? Well, Phil, Southwest says they will provide full refunds for those canceled tickets and they will fully reimburse the cost of those new tickets, but they say the whole process will likely take several weeks. Phil? Mm -hmm. All right, Alex Perez from Chicago tonight. Thank you. All right, now let's get to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking a New Year's storm threat. Hey, Rob. Hi, uh, Phil. We've got a threat for New Year's on the East Coast. We also have fresh winter storm watches and warnings that are now up again here in Colorado and Utah and Nevada and California, where the next pulse along this atmospheric river is pointed. Heavy rain coming in, wind as well. It'll be from Seattle down I-5 to San Francisco during the day tomorrow. A fresh pulse coming in on Saturday that'll nudge it south into Southern California. We'll see some flash flooding with this, especially in the foothills and in the higher elevations, two to five feet of additional snowfall with those high winds. It will be very difficult travel. There will be an avalanche threat into the Intermountain West as well. Pieces of this energy will get east of the Mississippi. When that happens, it's that moisture in the Gulf of Mexico and some warmth, warmth during the day uh, tomorrow. Storms rolling down I-10 and that warmth and moisture being pushed up the Carolinas during the day on Saturday. It looks to be a wet New Year's Eve from D.C. all the way up through Times Square. But at least it will be warm but wet for Times Square on New Year's Eve. Bill? Well, one out of two ain't bad. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. Right. He was a magician and a wonder on the soccer pitch and kept the world mesmerized with his skills and prowess. Today, soccer legend Pelé died after a long battle with cancer. He was a national treasure in his native Brazil, but transformed the world with the touch of a soccer ball. Brazil now planning two days of national mourning. Matt Rivers with the story. Tonight, the world mourning the loss of a giant, Pelé. The Brazilian legend many consider the greatest soccer player of all time, dead at age 82. His daughter sharing the news on Instagram saying, quote, all that we are is thanks to you. We will love you forever. Rest in peace. Pelé had been battling colon cancer and was hospitalized in early December. Born Edson Arantes do Nascimento in 1940, he grew up in poverty, in part honing his skills by kicking a rolled up sock stuffed with rags. Making his World Cup debut as a 17-year-old in 1958, Brazil's victory there rocketing him to global stardom. He would go on to win three World Cups in all, the only player in history to do so. After dominating in Brazil for nearly 15 years, Pelé brought his unique brand of soccer artistry to the U.S., coming out of retirement to play for the New York Cosmos in 1975, becoming an ambassador for the game, helping many Americans fall in love with the sport. 
as children, we learned his name and he brought us, he took us by the hand and brought us into soccer. After his career, Pelé was a passionate advocate for children's education while promoting soccer across the world. Pelé wore number 10, often worn by top playmakers. Tonight, tributes from other number 10s, including Brazilian forward Neymar, saying, quote, before Pelé, 10 was just a number. Argentinian Lionel Messi saying, rest in peace. Messi just won the World Cup, and Pelé was watching. In his last Instagram post before he died, he congratulated Messi and Argentina for the victory, writing, what a gift it was to watch. For years, it was Pelé himself who was a gift for so many of us. Matt joins us now. Matt, Pele's magic also really changed the way people here at home felt about soccer in general. Yeah, no question about it. In fact, in his last match here in the United States in 1977, Pelé managed to get everyone in the sold-out crowd to chant the word love in unison. Uh, and on Pelé's Instagram account today, tribute post harkened back to that moment, saying in part, quote, his message today becomes a legacy for future generations. Love, love, and love forever. Phil. Beautiful part of his legacy. Matt, thanks so much. Joining me now for more context and analysis on the legacy of this soccer giant is ESPN's Fernando Palomo. Fernando, it's good to see you. Thanks for being here with us tonight. Let's start Thanks by first talking. Let's start by first talking about the way Pele would dazzle the world every four years during an era when it wasn't really customary for players to leave their country and go play abroad, and the World Cup was the best opportunity for global exposure. He wrote on the back of that. Uh magical invention, which is television, and, and brought his name forth to millions of households and corners of the world that had never seen him move outside of a magazine or a newspaper photo. Uh, Pelé at 17 dazzled the world with his smile, and, and he went on to, in 1970, as the picture shows, win his third World Cup in full color in Mexico City. In 1958, he, he played with his idols. He was... Uh, a teammate to his idols in 1970, he became an idol to his teammates. And, and in that decade, he took the world's most popular sport to a new era, a new scenario. He put it in a whole different playing field. He traveled with his club Santos to every corner of the planet. He popularized the game. Some people knew of soccer after they knew of Pelé. It first came those four letters, Pelé, and then you realize you were talking about a great athlete, but what sport did he play? It, most people didn't know what soccer mm. was until they, they knew of Pelé. And, uh, and, and when you think of all the things that he did to, to expand the popularity of this game, that's when you come to realize that his uh, figure just transcended a sport and, and became an icon for sports and all. He was always a part of this never-ending debate of who's the greatest player of all time. In the end, he has the title of king. What kind of imprint does he leave on the sport in general, but specifically right here in the U.S.? Well, if you're going to talk about the sport in general and, and the sport being so vast and popular and, and, and you know, century-old sport that is played all over the world, to have just one player call or be called the greatest of all time it's kind of an injustice to the sports itself because it's been played at, at different levels in different eras with the advancements in technology and 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 medicine and how players treat themselves and take care of themselves nowadays much different than when it was when even when Pelé it was ruling the world uh, but if he was the greatest of his generation by undoubtedly the greatest of his generation and he is to be considered one of the greatest of all time. If there's a hallway that can carry the names or serve as exclusive club for those that can be called or be part of that debate, Pele holds the key to that door. That's how important he is. He is a, by far, without a debate, part of that exclusive club. And, and after him come Cruyff and Maradona and recently Leo Messi. But, but Pelé will always be part of that discussion. If there is a discussion around him, which I don't think there should be. His influence is clearly worldwide, but specifically, I want to know how you think he, he's going to continue to influence young Brazilians today. 
Well, by what we heard on the piece beforehand, the number 10 in the back of his shirt was just a number before Pelé wore it. Now it becomes a symbol of something bigger than just a great player. You've got to carry yourself with the with the elegance and and the ever-present youthful smile that Pelé always graced the world with. He was the first universal ambassador of the sport, and that's pretty much what the number 10 also has to carry on the back of that jersey. It serves... It's got a lot more weight now that he's gone. He, he he stands to become an immortal, of course. But the number 10 on, the, on his back should always be remembered uh, as having been worn by, by Pelé. And after him came all the others that, that used it because they were inspired by his lessons on the field. And off the field, he, as we see him now, was, was regarded as a public figure that wanted to be uh, touched by those that wanted some power. He met all the presidents you can imagine. He met all the popes you can imagine. He met world leaders as, as, as ones. Uh, he was more than just a, a football player. He was an, an ambassador of the sport, an ambassador of goodwill. He took the sport to, to Africa. I, I start reading stories about him, how he stopped the civil war in Nigeria just by his sole presence because of the Brazilian national team playing a friendly match in, in that country, and how Africa as a continent was inspired by the fact that this colored man was traveling around the world and ruling the world in the world's most popular sport. All right, Fernando Palomo, thank you so much from ESPN tonight. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Another passing of note to bring to you, fashion pioneer and designer Vivian Westwood has died. Westwood is known as a maverick who played a key role in the punk fashion movement. She began designing in the 1970s, eventually taking the world by storm with her urban street style designs. Westwood died peacefully at her home in London. She was 81 years old. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia unleashed a barrage of missiles overnight, causing casualties and blackouts all over Ukraine. ABC's Brick Clannett is in Kyiv. Overnight, firefighters battling a raging inferno at this power station in Kharkiv. Russia launching its biggest aerial attack on Ukraine in weeks. A deadly combination of missiles and drones. At least three people killed. New video showing one of those missiles flying over Kyiv. Ukraine claiming it intercepted 54 of the 69 projectiles fired at the country. Residents jolted out of their beds at the sound of explosions. Smoke rising above the capital. We visited one of the attack sites in the suburbs. This house still smoldering. This car is completely burnt out and there's rubble scattered all over this front yard. You can see the window is charred up there too. That's where a man was sleeping. He said he considers today his new birthday. He said a wall was collapsing in front of him. That is a miracle that he survived. His 79-year-old father, Leonard, was sleeping on the first floor when his bedroom walls collapsed onto him. Looking at your house, which is completely destroyed, it's a miracle that you were able to survive. Yes, it is a miracle, he tells me, adding, my son and I must have been born under a lucky star. And Phil, despite the wave of attacks here, a senior official telling ABC News tonight that Ukraine's operations in Russian-occupied Crimea and within Russia itself will continue. Phil? Brit Clinton tonight from Kyiv, thank you. There are new questions tonight about the background and finances of Congressman-elect George Santos, the New York Republican under pressure to resign after admitting to, quote, embellishing his education and work history. And now more inconsistencies are coming to light. Here's ABC's Aaron Katursky. Tonight, less than a week before he takes office, a growing clamor for Congressman-elect George Santos to resign. Watching this slow George Santos train wreck take place, mm -hmm. we need to stand together because we do not want to be represented by a clown. Santos is refusing to resign, ignoring mounting evidence he has lied about his career, his college, and now his high school. They sent me to a good prep school, so and which was Horseman uh, Prep in the Bronx. Santos claimed he attended the elite Horace Mann School, but the school told ABC News we have checked our records and he did not. Beyond questions about what he has done, there are questions about who he is. 
We don't carry the, the Ukrainian last name. Um, Santos, who is Catholic, played up are, Ukrainian uh, Jewish roots, war. suggesting his grandparents survived the Holocaust, something critics say he did to score political points. We should never need to lie about who we are and to lie about being descendants of Holocaust survivors for the purpose of political gain is beyond unacceptable. Understandable frustration. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, it seems like every day there's another lie that is uncovered. Are authorities or the GOP any closer to getting some real clarity on what Santos's real background is, who he is? They don't seem to be, Phil, because the statements that Santos has made this week meant to clarify things have only seemed to make things worse. He continues to alter his official biography. Tonight, a third prosecutor's office is now looking into some of his public filings and public statements. Meanwhile, Republican leaders in Washington remain silent, Phil. Yeah, just a bizarre story all around. Aaron Katursky, thank you. This week, a Michigan judge sentenced two men accused of leading a plan to kidnap Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer. It brings to an end one of the most closely watched domestic terror prosecutions in recent history. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel joins me now. Uh, Attorney General, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us about this. Thanks for having me. It's been more than two years since the FBI made the arrests in this case. Federal prosecutors requested a life sentence for the architect of this plan. He got 19 years, a sentence of 19 years. Is that sentence enough? And what does a lighter sentence say to the folks who are taking part in the rise in political violence across this country? So we're talking about six individuals who were charged federally, uh, eight who were charged by my department in state court. Um, and we do have uh, five individuals who still have cases that are pending and are expected to go to trial, likely in the spring. But what I will say for this, for the four individuals that were convicted in federal court and the three that were convicted so far in state court, you know, all of them have received uh, pretty significant sentences. Uh, and in something that was sort of a, a first of its kind, unfortunately, for our state and for our country. I mean, it's a pretty extraordinary thing to conspire to kidnap a sitting governor. Uh, I think that these um, sentences meet the gravity of the moment. Um, they are significant sentences. All of these individuals are going to do long stretches, either in federal penitentiaries or in state penitentiaries. And I think absolutely that those individuals that decide to protest their government through an illegal means using uh, violence are going to be met uh, with serious punishments by the state and federal government. Uh, and I think it's going to be uh, significant in terms of deterrence value uh, for, for those who are thinking of, of comporting themselves in a similar manner. So you're comfortable with where they stand right now, the sentences, and you you'd be comfortable if, if, if the ones coming up had sentences similar? I, I don't think that would be an unfair outcome. Uh, but, you know, I think, again, you know, people who are engaged in these sort of activities, and, and let's remember, you know, uh, there are all kinds of ways to protest the government legally, right? You can, you know, write your representative or your governor a, a letter. Um, you can support another candidate. Um, you know, you can protest peacefully, but obviously what you cannot do is you cannot take up arms against your government. And remember, we're not just talking about the governor of the state of Michigan. These are individuals that plotted to kill members of law enforcement. They plotted to kill members of our state legislature. Um, we were incredibly lucky. Remember, some of these individuals were actually in Lansing at the Michigan State Capitol on April 30th of 2020. Uh, which was, I think everybody believes, a precursor to the events at our nation's capital on January 6, 2021. And remember, I mean, they were prepared uh, to massacre as many people as possible. At the sentencing hearing for plot organizer Barry Croft, the prosecutor compared him to a foreign terrorist. And we'll quote this for you, saying, what ISIS or al-Qaeda calls a mujahideen, he calls a patriot. So do you see any difference between this type of group and a, a foreign terrorist organization? None whatsoever. And in fact, these different domestic terrorists, they actually compared themselves 
to these foreign terrorists. That was a badge of honor for them. Uh, and so their activities are no different whatsoever. I think it's unfortunate that under federal law, we don't necessarily have the same laws in place uh, in order to protect our nation against those kinds of plots. We could in this particular instance. I think that's something that Congress should take note of and understand that, you know, we've been told over and over again, whether it's by the FBI, whether it's by Homeland Security, uh, you know, that um, domestic terrorism is one of the biggest existential threats that we face in America right now. And we have to be prepared to meet it head on uh, and to take it very seriously. And if the sentences for these defendants is any indication, you know, people who engage in these kinds of activities uh, are going to be met with some very harsh sentences and spend a very long time behind bars. Michigan Attorney General Dana Nessel, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us tonight. Do appreciate it. Thanks for having me. President Biden signed the government funding omnibus bill into law while on vacation in St. Croix today, tweeting out an image of him signing the bipartisan bill which makes major investments in health care, disaster recovery, military and veterans funding, crucial assistance to Ukraine, as well as reforming the Electoral Count Act. When we come back, the desperate rush to save a woman trapped inside a sinking car after she drove it into a pond. And his standout style and larger-than-life personality have gained him more than 11 million followers. We're going to talk to Ricky Thompson about his inspirations and his journey to becoming more confident in this week's TikTok. Also, TV shows are making an effort to make fantasy and sci-fi series more reflective of the world we live in. But the change is being met with some intense backlash and subjecting creators to racist attacks. Along with actors, creators, and fans, we're gonna dive into the conversation over race and fantasy worlds. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Bring your friends. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's how you start your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. At a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. 
As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCnews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCnews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Welcome back and take a look at this dramatic rescue captured on body camera. It shows officers in Pennsylvania jumping into the water to save a woman who had driven her car into a pond. As the car quickly sank, police broke the driver's side window, managed to get the woman out. The 59-year-old driver was taken to the hospital with some minor injuries. Officials say she drove into the pond after misjudging a turn. New hit shows like HBO's House of the Dragon and Amazon's The Rings of Power are creating a firestorm over the role of diversity in fantasy and sci-fi series. It's led to intense backlash, even racist online attacks for some actors and social media influencers who've spoken out in favor of it. Alex Brochet explores this heated conversation with actors, creators, and fans. My name is Ryuko Matoy from the anime Kill la Kill, and um, she is... Marco. Who are you dressed as? Uh, I'm dressed as Sam Wilson's Captain America from the MCU. How are we feeling? Overwhelmed, yeah. speechless, excited. Costume fans flocking to New York Comic Con to celebrate their favorite characters. As some of their favorite actors face criticism for merely existing in their respective projects. <laughs> from dwarves working to save Middle Earth from evil. Durden didn't tell me you were coming. Durden didn't know to the battle for power in Westeros, to the fight to vanquish the Empire. Black actors have been front and center in these spinoffs and prequels that are taking new looks at familiar worlds, but not all fans have welcomed the change. Racist comments aimed at a black performer. One of the new hit stars of the Star Wars series, Obi-Wan Kenobi, revealing she's been subjected to racist attacks online. Dragons are okay, fire-breathing dragons, and people with white hair that are born like that when they're little <laughs> and violet eyes, but the black people in it is just a bridge too far for these <laughs> That's guys. what he said! With so much backlash, black fans are beginning to think the real fantasy is a world in which they don't exist. From my point of view, I've never been in the public eye to this degree before. Sophia Nambetti plays Disa, Princess of the Dwarf Kingdom and the Rings of Power, Amazon's TV series based on J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings books. It's the most expensive show ever made. One day this will be your kingdom. Some of the things that myself and Ismail and other members of the company have experienced blew my mind. It is violent, it is harassment, it is aggressive, it is racist. It's sometimes threatened the lives of us and our families. As Sophia and her Rings of Power castmates aim to build a world of fantastic proportions, they face criticism from some people who didn't buy into that fantasy. Nobody's asking you what you think. This is what we're doing. And you're invited to come and enjoy and experience. Or if you don't want to, you don't have to. This is John Ridley, an Academy Award winning screenwriter and director. He also faced backlash last year for his work creating the first black Batman, Jace Fox. It was less about, oh, he's a black Batman. It was about the Fox family and about the family that just became one of the richest families on the planet. Ridley says it's not necessarily about diversity per se, but rather, are these characters reflective of our reality? And he's become unwavering in his mission. And I would just love for young people out there to not have to bridge that gap between what's on the page and who they are. Representation matters. Um, it, it mattered in the 60s, it mattered in the 70s, it mattered in the 80s, I mean, it, 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 it matters. That's LeVar Burton, best known for his role as Lieutenant Commander Georgie LaForge in Star Trek The Next Generation, a series that has embraced black actors from the start, most notably with its casting of Nichelle Nichols as Nyota Uhura in the original series. See, in our century, we've learned not to fear words. So seeing Nichelle Nichols in the original series of Star Trek meant the world to me as a young black kid growing up in, in Sacramento, California. I was constantly looking for validation on TV when I was growing up, you know? And that's another reason why Star Trek was so important, because it was rare. It was rare to see black people on TV in positive roles, right? For Burton, having been one of the most visible black actors in this predominantly white space, he says the recent fandom reactions seem unique. I don't remember this kind of butthurt from what I call my melanin-challenged brethren and sistren. I think that that sense of grievance that, that has been expressed of late um, really comes because the, we've turned a corner. 
where we we recognize uh, on a grand scale how important representation is. To those who are privileged, equality seems like punishment. Growing up, I didn't see too many people that look like me. I think people really want to feel included. I think that's extremely important. With much of the conversation about diversity happening online, we ventured to one of the only places multiple fandoms can interact in person, New York Comic Con. This is Juju Green, a movie and TV commentator known to his more than 3 million TikTok followers as Straw Hat Goofy. I try to provide perspective. And not just perspective from my own personal life, but just as like a black man growing up in America. Green found himself at the center of racist attacks last year when he started posting commentary on Disney Plus's The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. So let's talk about The Falcon and the Winter Soldier and how it's already bringing up ideas of racism and microaggressions in the MCU. Anytime he posts a video like that one, intense backlash would soon follow. For that to come from my followers, people who chose to make me their movie person, and then invalidate my experience, invalidate my perspective. It was heartbreaking. Then came the Falcon and the Winter Soldier finale, directly confronting some of the themes Green posted about. The fight you're taking on ain't gonna be easy, Sam. We built this country, bled for it. I'm not gonna let anybody tell me I can't fight for it. <laughs> Y'all didn't even wanna hear the conversation. Y'all didn't even wanna have it. Enough said. It took the character of Isaiah Bradley to say it out loud for people to finally say, oh, okay, that's what it's about. I think there's a contingent of people, whether online or in real life, who will always deny that things are about race, but it's good to have the discussion out there either way. Fantasy, sci-fi, creativity, any kind of storytelling, it belongs to all of us. I don't know that I can answer why somebody would be so upset that a person that looks like me would tell the story of being a dwarf in a fantasy show. There isn't an argument as to why people of colour cannot be in a fantasy world. There is no argument, non-negotiable. My introduction to a fan base really was The Lord of the Rings. They're fictional characters for kids and you know, fans to see themselves being represented as being able to be whoever they want to be. I, I think it's beautiful what they're doing. We are surrounded by cosplayers and fans and children who look to us and are so happy and excited and grateful. We used to have white actors put on yellow makeup to play Asians. It was wrong then, it's wrong now. When you know better, you do better. The scope of the attacks is widening as studios continue to hire black actors for upcoming projects to play characters that were previously white, including Halle Bailey as Ariel in Disney's The Little Mermaid. Part of that world. The hope is that these fantasy characters will one day look just as diverse as the people who love them. My experience is mine and yours is yours, so there has to be an open dialogue and they have to be able to receive it, understand where the people are coming from. It's not just your show, it's out for public consumption. So if you want to be upset about it, well, go sit in a corner and think about your life. Alex Perche, thank you for that. And still ahead here on Prime, the reward being offered in the search for a suspect who vandalized an historic church in Atlanta. The new investigation into quarterback Tua Tungabailoa on his on-field concussion. And remembering a soccer legend, we're going to take a look at Pele's extraordinary career by the numbers. And as we look back at his legacy in our tweet of the day, NASA urges us to look up. This beautiful image was captured in space of a spiral galaxy in the constellation Sculptor, and it shows the colors of Pele's home country, Brazil. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're baby. making magic.
with so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Pole. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay. He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out. It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Pole. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Nat Geo Wild. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. So, what's good to read? And we mean really good to read right now. Well, that's where Charlie and Kate Gibson can help. Join us for the new podcast series. It is called The Bookcase with Kate and Charlie. We will make sure you love what you read. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. As we pay respects to soccer legend Pele tonight, here's a look at just some of his greatness by the numbers. 1,279 career goals. That's the number in the Guinness Book of World Records, although it includes every match he's ever played, and the tracking can be a bit spotty. What is certain, his 77 goals in international matches and 680 goals in official club matches made him the greatest scorer of all time until Lionel Messi edged him out last year. He had three World Cup wins. That is more than any other player in history. He was just 17 years old when he played his first World Cup, scoring six goals to lead Brazil to its first World Cup victory. His magic on and off the field captivated the world. Two days. That's how long armies on both sides of the civil war in Nigeria agreed to a truce so both sides could watch him play. Three hours is how long the Shah of Iran waited at an airport just to speak with him. And one is the number of soccer balls ever bounced off a president's head. Secret Service permitted Pele to lob one at President Ford. 10 million American TV viewers watched in 1975 when he joined the New York Cosmos. League attendance rose 80 percent, pushing them to larger and larger stadiums. His final game drew 77,691 people to Giant Stadium. That is the largest crowd ever to attend a U.S. soccer game. Remembering Pelly tonight, by any measure, a remarkable life and a remarkable legacy. We still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The consequences after a brawl breaks out during a basketball game and the search for a rapper whose family says haven't spoken to him in months. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. It's so much happening these days, it's hard to keep up. Things change hour by hour, minute by minute. The historic weather that's now unfolding. The worries on Wall Street. We're bringing you the right now. Been a nationwide teacher shortage. The right now look at the day ahead. An alert this morning for dog owners and the key takeaways from the biggest stories. World News Now and America This Morning, America's number one early morning news. Today does feel a little different. Early mornings on ABC News Live. This is where I belong. This is home. Real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're making magic. magic. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While 
It's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked. Don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're gonna love it. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues. The Hunt. True crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Another day of frustration for Southwest Airlines passengers. Over the last week, the airline canceling more than 15,000 flights after the massive storm. But Southwest saying it plans to return to normal operations with minimal disruptions Friday, potentially bringing relief to stranded holiday travelers. Southwest blaming the problems on the powerful winter storm, but its pilots association says outdated scheduling software and infrastructure also played a role. In Buffalo, New York, roads have reopened along with the airport following the blizzard that crippled the city. Not such good news in Denver, though. Snow there closing that city's airport and leaving countless cars stranded. I could go into a fatal cardiac situation at any time. The travel chaos proving especially consequential for an Alaska man looking for a heart transplant. Patrick Holland was set to fly from Fairbanks to Seattle to receive a transplant from what was said to be a perfect match. But his flight was canceled because of the storm, and a later flight that he did get onto was diverted to Anchorage. 56-year-old Holland, who suffers from congestive heart failure, ended up missing the window for his transplant. And then they said someone else was going to get it, and I understood. I understood it's going to be somebody's Christmas miracle. Holland, now back on the waiting list, hopeful for another match. I'll get that heart, and I'll get 30 years out of it. You know, I'll get 20 years out of it. Israel swearing in Benjamin Netanyahu as prime minister again. This will be Netanyahu's sixth term as prime minister, but the first one where he has handed powerful positions to the far right and ultra-Orthodox. Contrary to Netanyahu's claims, especially to the U.S. media, he did agree in coalition agreements to advance radical judicial reform, Israeli annexation of the West Bank, and legalizing discrimination against minorities. He's still on trial on charges of bribery, fraud, and breach of trust, but says he's innocent. The FBI is looking for the suspects behind vandalism at the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church. A spray-painted message reading, if abortions aren't safe, neither are you, was found on an outside wall of the church, which has been pastored by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and is currently led by Senator Raphael Warnock. Officials said the vandalism happened on July 3rd and that a group of 10 individuals dressed in all black were seen near the site of the vandalism that night. The group was seen later without the dark clothing. The FBI is offering $10 thousand dollars for information in the case. The family of a Grammy-nominated rapper has filed a missing persons report for him in Los Angeles. Police say Theophilus London was last seen on October 15th in the Skid Row area of the city and that family members have lost all contact with him and are worried. The rapper has released three albums and collaborated multiple times with Kanye West. He received a Grammy nomination for a feature on one of West's songs in 2016. An NBA game between the Detroit Pistons and Orlando Magic descending into chaos. The Magic's Mo Wagner and the Pistons' Killian Hayes were chasing a loose ball when Wagner appeared to nudge Hayes into the Pistons' bench. As players from both teams rushed over, Hayes appeared to hit Wagner in the back of the head, sending him falling into the bench as the scrum grew. Eventually, the teams were pulled apart. Wagner received a flagrant foul and was ejected, while Hayes and Hamadou Diallo of Detroit were also ejected. No suspensions have been announced.
The NFL and its players union are reviewing whether proper protocols were followed in the latest concussion involving Miami Dolphins quarterback Tua Tungabailoa. The Dolphins QB is in concussion protocol for the second time this season after a concussion during the team's loss to the Green Bay Packers on Christmas Day. That comes after controversy over how a concussion he suffered earlier in the season was handled. He is not expected to start in this Sunday's game. We're going to turn now to our weekly segment, TikTok, where we interview some of our favorite TikTokers, taking a closer look at the story behind the sensation. Our next guest is taking the fashion industry by storm. Media mogul Ricky Thompson has cultivated an audience of 11 million followers across all social media platforms. With his larger-than-life personality, trend-setting styles, and his unique dance moves, our Stephanie Ramos sat down with Thompson to learn more about his rise to fame in this week's TikTok. So, Ricky, you are known for having a very unique fashion sense. Tell us where that eclectic style came from. When I was growing up, I was so obsessed with Tumblr, and that was like my biggest thing ever. I just loved fashion so much. And I feel like I'm just always been obsessed with looking good. Like that's my thing. And I love looking good in like different ways. So I started, you know, trying different things in fashion and I became obsessed with it. Like I love shopping. I do it all the time. Is there anybody in particular that you looked up to as you were growing up in the fashion world? Honestly, I would have to say Rihanna, honestly. I like literally just watched her become like this fashion girl and she's mm -hmm. somebody who takes risk on the carpet anywhere she goes and I love that. I feel like fashion is all about, you know, being different and really experimenting with different things. And she's like one of the only people that I saw growing up do that. So I was like, you know what? I want to be like her. So Rihanna definitely. Mm -hmm. And here you are. You know, <laughs> right? Like this girl I'm making it. I'm like, I love that. <laughs> I love it too. Now, a, a lot of your early content addressed your experience with being bullied, for being gay, and for your choice of fashion. Right. Fast forward to today, you are thriving and doing fantastic. You're gracing magazine covers like Gay Times, Ten Men Magazine, Out Magazine, and so many others. Is there something along the way that you learned about yourself like recently that you that you didn't know before? I would say I gained even more confidence than I've had before. It's like a funny thing because when I first started, I remember I moved to LA and I went to a modeling agent. And they told me, they said, you know what? You're just too funny for fashion. And I was like, wow. And that stuck with me. But then, you know, I said, you know what? I took that and I was okay, I'm gonna prove y'all wrong. And now look at me, now I'm here. I've graced multiple covers and you know, it just made me feel good about myself. In being on this journey toward acceptance, at any point did you try and alter yourself and, and not crack jokes and not be funny when you were out at, on calls or auditions or whatever? Did you try to adjust yourself and then realize, wait a minute, what am I doing? I have to be myself. Yes, 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 I did do that. I did that because I guess that comment really stuck to me a lot. And I was just, I just didn't want to become like the joke all the time. So I was like, you know what? I'm done. I'm done trying to alt myself. I'm just going to be myself. I'm not changing for nobody, Chad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you shouldn't. Yeah. So a lot has happened for you in the last few yeah. years. You started yeah. as this, uh, you were popular on Vine back in 2015. Yeah. This year, you were honored as Forbes 30 under 30. How does that feel? What what went through your mind when you heard this news? Oh my goodness, honestly, I still cannot believe it. Because I remember like growing up and looking at Forbes 30 to 30, I was like, well, oh, that's cute. Maybe one day, I never thought that I would ever be a part of that list at such a young age. Like I'm 26 years old. I've done this whole journey on my own and it happened. I'm like, wow, it literally just by me being myself, like this is an amazing thing, honestly. I remember, just growing up and I was going through so much, you know, the struggles, being bullied and all that. And now I am here today, Forbes 30 to 30. I don't give myself a pat on the back. I'm Let's so do happy. it. Where yes. are those bullies yes. now? Where right. are they now? Right. right. Do they know right. what's happening here? <laughs> so are they keeping up? 5.9 million on Instagram? Yes. Okay. Come on. Come Let me on. take my follow back. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Congratulations on all of your success. I'm so Thank happy for you. you. So uh, you co-host a smash hit Spotify exclusive podcast. So this is called We Said What We Said. Tell yes. us more about the show and what we can expect in the upcoming fourth season. It's me and my best friend, Denzel, um, we started it during COVID. Me and him are so real and we play off each other so well. We're just spilling our tea, telling stories about because we travel all the time together. We're just really showing you guys like real friendship, best friends, just talking about anything and everything. So yes, the fourth season, it gets juicier and juicier. So let's go back to the fashion. So is yeah. there a favorite red carpet look that really sticks with you that had just so much meaning, just something that really stands out? Favorite red carpet look. Okay, I'm gonna do my Oscars look. When I wore a GTDS, I wore this bodysuit with this cape it was like both jewel like skeleton when i wear that outfit i loved it so much the internet broke they're like who do you think you are wearing this to the oscar i said yeah i want to be extra i'm going to the oscars hello and let me tell you something everyone knew me in that room okay so going into 2023 it's time for new beginnings is there a specific look that you would leave behind in 2022 where it's like uh-uh let's not let's not Bring that into the new uh, year. That needs to stay behind. For me, I want to stop wearing crop tops. I am so, I'm wearing crop tops all the time. You know what? I'm turning 27 and I, you know, <laughs> I want to be more grown, you know? So right. yeah, I'm, I'm leaving my crop tops behind. Um, and last question for you, you know, the, the internet loves you for your for so for everything that you do, but especially your confidence. What helps you stay so positive? Oh my goodness, wow. I will say it was not easy. It was not easy at all. I feel like my fans really helped me out a lot. Like being able to see how much I can make someone smile or make someone feel good makes me feel amazing. If someone is having a bad day and I can make them smile, that just makes me so happy and it just fills up my confidence even more. You're making me smile. Oh. You made my day. Thank you so oh. much. Stephanie, Ricky, thank you both very much for that. Before we go tonight, the image of the day, the countdown is on, 2023 is coming. And in Times Square today, there was a confetti test run in preparation for the New Year's Eve celebration. When the clock strikes midnight on the big night, 1.5 tons of confetti will fall. It's a lot of confetti. That's our show for this hour. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of today's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, we are staying on top of a few things. The latest on the growing measles outbreak. It's only spreading among children. And prosecutors are revealing a possible motive for the man accused of killing his wife and son. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. You never know what you're gonna get on this show. That's all I'm gonna tell you. Yes, Whoopi! This mic on? Can you hear me out there? Behind the scenes is always a better show. Absolutely, always. absolutely. That's what people don't see during the commercial break. Right, they don't. What happened? I had no idea really what I was getting myself into. That day that we walked out, I, I treasured that day. I just, I couldn't sit there. You're doing good, Joy. You're doing good. Oh, yeah, baby. It was crazy. Behind the table. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. We're honored. ABC's 2020 winner of three Emmy Awards for Excellence. Thank you for making 2020 Friday night's most watched and most honored news magazine. This is where I belong. This is home. Really?
real dirt in the sunlight again. I'm very excited. Anything could happen at any moment. My heart is so happy right now. We're making magic. We're Rachel. making magic. I'm Phil Lipoff, in for Lindsay Davis tonight. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. After admitting he fabricated parts of his personal and professional life, GOP Congressman-elect George Santos is now facing multiple probes into his financial background by prosecutors in the districts he represents. They're primarily interested in the sources of his wealth and how he seemed to go from rags to riches nearly overnight. A growing measles outbreak in Ohio is spreading only in children. Health officials say uh, the first cases were detected two months ago. As of this week, there are 82 confirmed measles cases in central Ohio, all in children. Officials say all of the infected only received one dose of the needed two-dose measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. And police in western New York are looking to thank this man. They say saved multiple lives during the blizzard. Chictawaga police are calling the mystery hero Merry Christmas Jay. Officials say he pulled people from cars, sheltering them in nearby schools, and also left a note apologizing for the damage caused by the snowblower used to make a path. Meantime, another storm is slamming the West and moving across the country as we speak as millions get ready to welcome in the new year. In Denver, heavy and wet snow crippled traffic, stranded drivers trapping them in their cars for hours. In Buffalo, as bulldozers clear record snowfall, new concern about flooding as that snow melts. Mola Lange in Colorado. With millions hitting the roads ahead of the new year, a travel nightmare unfolding overnight in Colorado. This is crazy. Oh, boy. A fast developing snowstorm and faster falling temperatures sending things from bad to worse in a hurry on Interstate 70 outside Denver. Storm chaser Aaron Rigsby among hundreds of stranded drivers, some of them walking their dogs on the highway. There has been so many accidents and so many stuck vehicles that I-70 has now been shut down for almost 10 hours. There's been a few people that I think were in the tunnel that were a little worried about uh, carbon monoxide and they had their kind of doors propped up with like a towel in front of it. The heavy wet snow doing heavy damage to downtown Denver. As you can see, the storm system bringing down branches and limbs blocking roadways uh, in the area. At its peak, snow was coming down at a rate of two inches per hour. Even more limbs coming down right there, crashing into a storefront, shattering the business's window. The storms fueled by an atmospheric river that's pounding the West Coast with wind and rain. Meanwhile, in blizzard-ravaged western New York, the death toll continues to rise as authorities perform welfare checks. City officials finally lifting the ban on non-emergency vehicles. They're making headway, but as our Mona Kozar-Abdi reports, the work is far from over. With temperatures rising, the snow is starting to melt. Officials are clearing storm drains in anticipation of any flooding, and the state is on standby with 800,000 sandbags. In Wrightsville, Pennsylvania, the Susquehanna River blocked by huge chunks of ice. They're worried about more flooding there, too, tonight. Mola, thank you. And after that Christmas travel nightmare, Southwest Airlines is now saying it expects to return to normal operations Friday. Today, though, it accounted for more than 90% of the flights canceled all across the country. The meltdown has stranded tens of thousands of passengers and cluttered airports with unclaimed baggage. ABC's Alex Perez with the latest. Tonight, Southwest Airlines vowing a return to normal operations is just hours away. Writing in a statement, we are encouraged by the progress we've made to realign crew, their schedules, and our fleet, and that they expect only minimal disruptions tomorrow. That moment can't come soon enough for the scores of families dealing with canceled flights, lost luggage, and unexpected expenses. The airline's chief commercial officer with this message. My personal apology is the first step of making things right after many plans changed and experiences fell short of your expectations of us. We're continuing the work to make this up to you. The airline canceling more than 2,300 flights today, more than 15,000 flights in all since last week Wednesday. I've never seen anything like this. This is absolutely crazy. After five days without her luggage, Christina Ariazola finally reunited with her belongings Wednesday at Dallas's Love Field. 
We've been hopping the stores, just buying clothes and toiletries and whatever we can. And I don't even have my medications because I mistakenly just put them in the suitcase. At Chicago's Midway Airport, officials there say the remaining unclaimed Southwest bags have been moved to a secure location. Baggage carts loaded with suitcases visible on the tarmac. Southwest now saying they will honor a reasonable request for reimbursement for meals, hotel, and alternate transportation from people whose flights were canceled or significantly delayed between December 24th and January 2nd. The airline urging travelers to submit receipts through their website. And Alex joins us now from Chicago's Midway Airport. Alex, we're starting to hear from families who had to buy more expensive tickets after their original Southwest flight got canceled. So what's the airline saying about that tonight? Well, Phil, Southwest says they will provide full refunds for those canceled tickets and they will fully reimburse the cost of those new tickets, but they say the whole process will likely take several weeks. Phil? Mm -hmm. All right, Alex Perez from Chicago tonight. Thank you. All right, now let's get to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano, who's tracking a New Year's storm threat. Hey, Rob. Hi, uh, Phil. We've got a threat for New Year's on the East Coast. We also have fresh winter storm watches and warnings that are now up again here in Colorado, in Utah, in Nevada, and California, where the next pulse along this atmospheric river is pointed. Heavy rain coming in, wind as well. It'll be from Seattle down I-5 to San Francisco during the day tomorrow. A fresh pulse coming in on Saturday that'll nudge it south into Southern California. We'll see some flash flooding with this, especially in the foothills. And in the higher elevations, two to five feet of additional snowfall with those high winds. It will be very difficult travel. There will be an avalanche threat into the Intermountain West as well. Pieces of this energy will get east of the Mississippi. When that happens, it's that moisture in the Gulf of Mexico and some warmth, warmth during the day uh, tomorrow. Storms rolling down I-10 and that warmth and moisture being pushed up the Carolinas during the day on Saturday. It looks to be a wet New Year's Eve from D.C. all the way up through Times Square. But at least it will be warm but wet for Times Square on New Year's Eve. Bill? Well, one out of two ain't bad. Rob Marciano, thanks so much. Right. He was a magician and a wonder on the soccer pitch and kept the world mesmerized with his skills and prowess. Today, soccer legend Pele died after a long battle with cancer. He was a national treasure in his native Brazil, but transformed the world with just the touch of a soccer ball. Brazil now planning two days of national mourning. Here's our Matt Rivers. Tonight, the world mourning the loss of a giant, Pele. The Brazilian legend many consider the greatest soccer player of all time, dead at age 82. His daughter sharing the news on Instagram saying, quote, all that we are is thanks to you. We will love you forever. Rest in peace. Pelé had been battling colon cancer and was hospitalized in early December. Born Edson Arantes do Nascimento in 1940, he grew up in poverty, in part honing his skills by kicking a rolled up sock stuffed with rags. Making his World Cup debut as a 17-year-old in 1958, Brazil's victory there rocketing him to global stardom. He would go on to win three World Cups in all, the only player in history to do so. After dominating in Brazil for nearly 15 years, Pelé brought his unique brand of soccer artistry to the U.S., coming out of retirement to play for the New York Cosmos in 1975, becoming an ambassador for the game, helping many Americans fall in love with the sport. As children, we learned his name, and he brought us, he took us by the hand and brought us into soccer. After his career, Pelé was a passionate advocate for children's education while promoting soccer across the world. Pelé wore number 10, often worn by top playmakers. Tonight, tributes from other number 10s, including Brazilian forward Neymar, saying, quote, before Pelé, 10 was just a number. Argentinian Lionel Messi saying, rest in peace. Messi just won the World Cup, and Pelé was watching. In his last Instagram post before he died, he congratulated Messi and Argentina for the victory, writing, what a gift it was to watch. For years, it was Pelé himself who was a gift for so many of us. Indeed, what a legacy, Matt. Thank you. Now we head to Europe, where prayers and concern from around the globe continue to pour in for Pope Emeritus Benedict. The 95-year-old is said to be lucid and alert, but in serious condition. ABC's Marcus Moore at the Vatican for us tonight. Tonight, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI receiving around-the-clock care here at this monastery in Vatican City. The 95-year-old Benedict seen in these images taken earlier this month visibly frail. 
The Vatican releasing a statement saying Benedict is, quote, lucid, conscious, and stable, but remains in serious condition. Benedict retired in 2013 at the age of 85, the first pontiff to step down in nearly 600 years, citing a lack of strength of mind and body. I think he's won the hearts of many people. All these years that he's been living sort of in retirement, in silence. But the church's sexual abuse scandal cast a long shadow over his papacy. Outside St. Peter's Basilica today, many reflecting on Benedict's time as pontiff. I think he will be remembered as a great theologist, and I think he was a great pope. Phil, the Diocese of Rome has scheduled a special uh, public mass in Benedict's honor on Friday as Pope Francis today renewed his calls for all to join in continued prayers for his predecessor in these difficult hours. Phil. Marcus, thank you. Now to the war in Ukraine. Russia unleashed a barrage of missiles overnight, causing casualties and blackouts all over Ukraine. ABC's Britt Clement in Kyiv. Overnight, firefighters battling a raging inferno at this power station in Kharkiv. Russia launching its biggest aerial attack on Ukraine in weeks. A deadly combination of missiles and drones. At least three people killed. New video showing one of those missiles flying over Kyiv. Ukraine claiming it intercepted 54 of the 69 projectiles fired at the country. Residents jolted out of their beds at the sound of explosions. Smoke rising above the capital. We visited one of the attack sites in the suburbs. This house still smouldering. This car is completely burnt out and there's rubble scattered all over this front yard. You can see the window is charred up there too. That's where a man was sleeping. He said he considers today his new birthday. He said a wall was collapsing in front of him. That is a miracle that he survived. His 79-year-old father, Leonard, was sleeping on the first floor when his bedroom walls collapsed onto him. Looking at your house, which is completely destroyed, it's a miracle that you were able to survive. Yes, it is a miracle, he tells me, adding, my son and I must have been born under a lucky star. Brick Lennon in key for us tonight. Now to the trial of that once prominent South Carolina attorney charged with killing his wife and son. And prosecutors now pointing to Alec Murdoch's alleged financial crimes as a possible motive in those killings. ABC's Elwin Lopez with the latest. New revelations in the case of the disgraced South Carolina attorney accused of killing his wife and son. In court documents obtained by ABC News, prosecutors writing Alec Murdoch was simply running out of options to avoid not just accountability, but the certainty of long prison time financial ruin. Prosecutors are now linking the deadly boat crash involving Murdoch's son, Paul, to his father's financial crimes, which they say gave him a motive for murder. All five of us are on the bank, but we're, we're missing one person. Paul accused of being under the influence in 2019, crashing a boat, killing a 19-year-old passenger. The prosecution writing, Paul had become a significant liability to defendant, and the boat case threatened to ruin him. Paul was murdered before his case could go to trial. If this evidence is allowed in, this is going to be a trial with fireworks and I think a lot of drama, a lot of information that we didn't have before. My name is Alec Murdoch. Please hurry. You don't want to open moving. Murdoch's wife Maggie and son Paul were shot to death at the family's home in June 2021. When police arrived, a prosecutor say Murdoch allegedly misleading investigators, indicating he thought the murders were tied to the boat case. But prosecutors allege Murdoch killed them to gain sympathy and shift the focus away from his alleged financial wrongdoings. Murdoch's defense team casting doubt on that argument, saying the state's theory that Murdoch murdered his wife and son in cold blood to distract the law firm from investigating financial improprieties is illogical, implausible, and unsupported by evidence. There's no evidence that Alec Murdoch would have reaped any financial benefit from murdering Paul and Maggie. Murdoch has pleaded not guilty in the murders. He's also accused of stealing almost $9 million from his clients and law firm and faces nearly 100 charges. The day of reckoning was upon him and he was out of cards to play after he's been playing every card he could for 10 years. 
Our thanks to Elwyn for that. And still to come tonight, rescuers in Cambodia work to free people trapped after a deadly fire tore through a casino hotel complex. And she went to prison for leaking 700,000 classified battlefield reports from Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, Chelsea Manning is opening up about the moment she uploaded those documents and what she wants Americans to know. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. Here at the White House. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Bring them on. If only there was a place in the morning to start my day. With a smile, somewhere to help me get in the know. A place as spectacular as, well, me. Hmm, I think we might know a place, right, guys? Bring your friends. Oh, wait, there is. Good morning, America. GMA, 7A, every day. Boom. 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 Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robin. Good morning, America. How are you? Boom. Now that's Bring how you start your, your day, people. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. As of today, in a big way, we have inaugurated ABCNews.com. A lot has changed in our world since Peter made that announcement. But what hasn't changed is the commitment to groundbreaking reporting and innovation at ABCNews.com. And here's to everything ahead. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world right now. Rescuers in Cambodia work to free people trapped after a fire broke out at a casino hotel complex in a town on the Thai border. At least 19 people were killed, dozens more missing. Cambodian police say hundreds joined the rescue efforts. The Colombian Navy intercepted two submarines carrying 4.5 tons of cocaine, making it the largest cocaine seizure of the past year. It's believed the cargo was headed to Central America. Hundreds of Israeli protesters gathered in front of Israel's parliament to protest against the inauguration of Benjamin Netanyahu's new government. His allies include the religious Zionism and Jewish power parties, which oppose Palestinian statehood and whose leaders have in the past gone against Israel's justice system, its Arab minority, and LGBTQ rights. Still, Netanyahu has repeatedly pledged to promote tolerance and pursue peace. Now to a conversation with Chelsea Manning, former Army intelligence analyst who leaked more than 700,000 classified documents in 2010 to WikiLeaks about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. After spending seven years in prison, her sentence was commuted by former President Obama in 2017. And her new book, readme.txt, referring to the name of the file she uploaded to WikiLeaks, making the military's secrets public, came out this fall. Lindsay Davis sat down with her to discuss the disclosure and what led to that point? A number of people are going to say, you know, I already know who Chelsea Manning is, and, you know, she leaked classified documents, and they feel some kind of way about that. It's the biggest leak in U.S. military history. Their names, their operations. It is an attack on the international community. Right. And so what would you say to those critics? Why should they take the, the time and, and money to actually read your story? I think that my voice and my sort of experience taken as a whole has been left out of this story. You know, everybody's been tr sort of treating me as an enigma, but I'm here, right? And so I'm just trying to tell my story. I'm a little late to the show. 
but um, I wanted to, to do this. And, and you're only 34, so you've made it clear this is not a memoir, but really a coming-of-age right. story. Talk to us about, you, you describe a really tumultuous childhood with both of your parents being alcoholics, your mom trying to commit suicide, the divorce, uh, you facing homelessness at a really early age. How did that all, all shape who you have become? Uh, it shaped all of me. Um, any one of those experiences would have been different and it wouldn't be me, right? So, um, you know, I, I did have a difficult upbringing. I mean, there were good, there were good times as well. But yeah, I, I felt, and I still feel to this day, like I was, um, I, I, I always felt underappreciated by my father and I always wanted to just get my father to say, you know, I, I appreciate you, I love you, I am proud of you, because it always felt like nothing was good enough for him. You talk about, though, in the book, how your dad seemed to be proud of you when you joined the military. Yes. A and your sister, conversely, you write, she told me I was a dumbass making a stupid impulsive move and that no matter how talented I was, there was no way I'd fit into the culture of the army. How did you make that decision going from just kind of starting to explore gay clubs at the time right. and then joining the military during the, the height of, of the Iraq war during Don't Ask, Don't Tell? I wanted to rekindle the relationship with my father. Mm. I, you know, I, he kicked me out of the house in uh, 2006 and uh, he had remarried and um, but I, I felt like there was unfinished business. I think I was also looking for, I was genuinely looking for some way of fitting in in the world, of having stability, and my father kept pitching stability and structure. But through all, I mean, in all of this, it was really just, I wanted to feel like I could make a mark on the world and not just be uh, struggling to stay afloat. Some people are going to hear you say that and say, that's what this is about. You wanted to make your mark on the world. What would you say that this is that really led you that day to decide to upload more than 700,000 classified documents? Right. I, you know, I, by the time I got into Iraq in 2010, or in 2009, we deployed. And by 2010, that was when I started to make these decisions. I, I had become very professional. I had this sense of purpose. Uh, and uh, the sense of I can do something and I can be a part of uh, something bigger uh, and then have that, you know, be uh, having this cognitive dissonance between something that I believe in and really have invested an enormous amount of time and energy into um, be contradicted by the realities on the ground. Come on. What is the truth that you wanted Americans to know? That the sanitized version of the Iraq war up to this point, this discourse had started to be sanitized again and started to be glossed over again. These cycles of retribution, of death and destruction, of, of brutality, and not having the, the public not having any full understanding of this. I wanted to make that available. I wanted that discussion to happen. Well, you write, it's not possible to work in intelligence and not to imagine disclosing the many secrets you bear. So yes, I would agree with that. On the flip side, though, there are thousands of people who've had a, a similar occupation and they didn't uh, disclose right. classified information. But they thought about it. You think so? I know so. What kept them from doing it? Well, probably the same reason why I, you know, I hesitated, which is, you know, a opportunity, a career. Uh, this, being in the military and, and being in intelligence in itself is a lifestyle. It's not just a career. So in addition to losing your career, you get court-martialed and sentenced to 35 years, which right. was actually the hardest sentence for anyone who would ever leak classified documents. During all of this time, 
you're also struggling with your, your gender identity, your sexual identity. And so even on that day in the bookstore when you're uploading the documents, you take a picture of yourself with a wig and makeup. Right. And, and you write about gender dysphoria and you say that it was like a toothache that never goes away. You're right. not always consciously thinking about it, but it's this persistent thing that you can't totally shake that keeps holding you back. When was the first time that you thought about changing um, your gender? Yeah, I didn't realize it was an option until my 20s, right? Uh, I didn't realize that you could seek access to care, that you could get hormone treatment, that you could get therapy, that you could, you know, that surgical options were available. I just didn't realize that, even though I knew something was, that I, I knew I was different at a very young age. It wasn't until I was in the military, and I'd been in the military for a few years, um, by the time I was deployed to Iraq, I, I knew for certain that this is, I needed a transition, that uh, this is the path that I, need, that I need to take in order to survive. And I'd like to read the book dedication. It says, this book is dedicated to the brave trans kids who struggle to live as themselves in a hostile world. You make me proud. Yes. What is your message beyond that to trans kids right now who are struggling and feeling uncomfortable perhaps in their own skin? You know, I went through that experience as a kid. I know what you're going through very deeply. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful that kids are able to even know this kind of information because I didn't when I was that age. And uh, I, you know, I just needed somebody to tell me that I was loved and appreciated for who I am. And that, that's all I want to say to them is that you are loved, you are appreciated, and um, that there is a community. And we've we, we had a progressive moment in the last decade where we've been able to make advances and find ourselves and find our community. We may lose some of that in the next few years. Uh, that's unfortunate, but also we're survivors and we can make it through. I've seen resiliency and survivability and solidarity. Many of these uh, these laws that have popped up and these these quote unquote debates that have popped up are going to roll back some of the progress of the last decade. That's not the end of the story. Lindsay Davis, thank you. And still to come, a news anchor shares her very personal family journey with cancer and the quest to find a life-saving treatment. It's the type of place where you can walk home by yourself late at night. It really is the perfect college town. Police are investigating the death of a freshman. The victim had been stabbed 19 times. I have never seen that much blood in any crime scene. She was one of us. She was everyone's best friend. Could have been any of us. I was just really scared. While it's wonderful to think that you can leave your doors unlocked, don't. Death in the dorms, only on Hulu. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. After an extraordinary newsmaking year, thank you for making ABC's This Week America's number one news and politics show on Sunday mornings. Zoo! 200! Oh, 200! 200 episodes of Dr. Paul. Oh. Music to my ears. It's been 10 years, and I'm still having the fun. That rocks. He's got the moves that make your animals groove. Now we do the dance of joy. Yay! He's like the Justin Bieber of the <laughs> Headlining the hottest barns. Shut out! It's a show you won't want to miss. I'm not going to be here forever. Maybe. <laughs> the Incredible Dr. Paul. New episodes Saturdays at 9 on Net Geo Wild. Before we go tonight, a reporter at our partner station, WLS in Chicago, is sharing a personal family journey with brain cancer and the technology being used in the hopes of helping others. Here's ABC's Morgan Norwood with the story. As a reporter and anchor in Chicago, Diane Papu is used to handling breaking news and tough stories. Still wicked out here because take a look. But on December 21st, 2020, she received some devastating news of her own. Her husband, Nick Adamski, diagnosed with brain cancer. When a doctor says to you, your spouse has brain cancer, when he's never had a single sign of anything before, it really just was so 
unbelievable to me. Patthew was on the air at ABC station WLS when she got the phone call that her husband suffered a massive seizure while at their home alone. Soon he was bleeding from his brain and needed emergency surgery to remove the grade four glioblastoma. That would mark the beginning of a series of treatments, including chemo and radiation. But despite the aggressive regimen, the cancer returned and doctors once again breaking even more disappointing news. He did chemo and radiation traditional 42 days. That's when he was given this expiration date and was told he only had 12 to 14 months to live. I think that's when for you, you said, Oh, heck no. Defiant, Diane and Nick went for a second opinion at Northwestern Medicine, where they were introduced to technology called methylation and genomic profiling. Think of it as essentially taking a fingerprint of a tumor, and then based on that fingerprint, doctors can help zero in on a possible treatment. 17 hours, he called me back and said, we have a treatment for you. It, it, it just felt fake. It felt like someone, like a prank phone call. It was a good feeling. And it still is today. Nick's tumor had a mutation that could be targeted by a drug that normally treats metastatic bladder cancer. The tumor started shrinking within days. To wake up every morning and say, I'm still here is better. I'll take the, uh, I'll take all of them. That's fine with me. I'll take everything they throw at me as long as I'm still breathing. An amazing story. Morgan, thank you for that. And of course, our best to Diane and Nick. That's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Phil Lipoff. Thanks for streaming with us.